So when I was a teenager thinking about being a writer and learning what writers do, I never imagined them sitting in a chair writing <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. I had a notion of the performance. I imagine the writing came quickly and you just, you know, put it down in your notebook while lounging about in a park-like setting. <laughs> I did not know that it just takes a huge amount of sitting. I never can find the right chair. I never, I think that I gotta have a different chair. <laughs> Every time I finish a book, I can't stand the chair I finished the book in. So I often just give them away. But that's no big deal because they usually came off a curb anyhow. <laughs> Hyde Erdrich is an Ojibwe writer of poetry, short stories, and nonfiction. She also edits journals to promote literature from other Native American writers. Ladies and gentlemen, Hyde Erdrich. When I think about my writing, I want it to be funny. I want it to have different intellectual layers. I want it to share my intellectual curiosity. So this is autobiography as mixed tape. All that I read, I misread. All that I heard, I misheard. My skull holds a bowl of spark soup imprinted with grooves that ripple briefly and remove their paths so faint traces remain, yes. As if sparks in dark liquid could know, guess, our first and most ancient medium, mud and sticks, or no, our hands, the thumb of the beloved, gesture trace, mother's touch, creator's breath. In my poetry, I feel like I'm deeply engaged in expressing an indigenous worldview. Someone else might read it and not see that at all. That's a good thing to me because I don't want to explain for non-native people. I want to express things that I'm understanding finally. What I have to say, I've said, in glyph and graph, incised, inscribed, sprayed, scratched, pen and pencil, ink and etching and charcoal, with my hand as template for mammoth back and pregnant mare. Usually when people look at my work, they talk about female experience in the body. I, know, I think I'm kind of known for that. I think I'm known for writing about a woman's experience, maybe in ways that um, I hope are you know, slightly enlightening. What I have to say, I've said with light. What I have to say, I've said, yet never made my meaning known. I just, I love to read to an audience, to think about how the human voice sounds just by itself, you know, just by itself. No music, no, nothing but the power of the words. All that I read, I misread. All that I heard, I misheard. Don't go out tonight, it's bound to take your life. There's a bathroom on the right. <laughs> I don't remember not wanting to write. Probably around the time I started reading books, I wanted to start writing books. I grew up in North Dakota, in a small town, Wahpeton, which is on the border of Minnesota. I have six siblings and a large extended family. My parents were both teachers. You know, I think most people fight their parents on their career paths if they're artists or writers especially, but my sister Louise's career took off, and so my parents didn't object. <laughs> they are like, mm, yeah, maybe. This is Birch Park Books, my sister's bookstore. It's a big part of my life. I come here at least once a week. Love the artists and the writers that are represented here. Can you imagine having, you know, Louise Erdrich curate your book selection for you? It's like the best neighborhood bookstore you could possibly hope for. So I really love it. 
These are the books from Wigwas Press. They're Ojibwe language books that I direct. So I work with the illustrator, the team that produces the writing. They're the only monolingual Ojibwe illustrated books and they're used by language immersion programs. I have my own poetry world here, look at this. This one's me, this one's me, here I am again. This was my first book, Fishing for Myth. And then my second book, National Monuments. This book sold the most of all my books, but I still never got a royalty check over 100 bucks. <laughs> and Cell Traffic is new and selected poems on maternal fetal stem cell traffic, about how cells go back and forth between um, us and our mother and other generations, our siblings, and how we literally live with one another, um, within one another's bodies. And I thought it was an interesting metaphor to explore. This is Franklin Avenue. It's home to the largest urban American Indian population in the country. It's our little town. I guess, you know, in some places there'd be like a little Italy. This is, this is the urban res. In 2007, I began curating shows at All My Relations Gallery. It features Native artists almost exclusively. We have the most amazing Native artists in our community. Well, this place means a lot to me because I've formed a lot of my, my personal vision responding to visual art, thinking about artists, working with artists, eventually collaborating with artists, and so many projects have come out of this. So for me, it's entirely meaningful. I love to cook. I like to read cookbooks. It's like a class of literature that I like to read. I hadn't seen a contemporary Native American cookbook that was about what people actually cook in their kitchens. So the book turned into Original Local, Indigenous Foods, Stories, and Recipes from the Upper Midwest. I wanted people to think about how the local foods movement really depends on foods that Indigenous people stewarded and protected and saved all these years. I focused on uh, wild rice manuman the indigenous hand-harvested wild rice, which is very different from the hard black patty rice, the cultivated rice. It's the food that's central to the story of how Ojibwe came to the upper Midwest, so that was a, a, an entire chapter to itself. When I got done with the book, I realized I'd written about 40,000 words of nonfiction, which I had never expected to do. I thought it was gonna be a simple assignment. It was two years of intense research and development, cooking these recipes over and over and over again. We just decimated everything in our kitchen. We broke everything. We, you know, like every appliance had damage. And a lot of my friends got used to eating a lot of good food. And uh, then I just abruptly quit doing it afterwards. <laughs> And there's now a resurgence in interest in gardening programs, and uh, not because of the cookbook, but current with it, there's been a huge indigenous foods movement. And I'm glad to have just a little part in that.